Thank you. Ha, ha, ha. All right, you're cutting into your question and answer time. Sit down. I don't need a host. I love this. This is my favorite thing to do, to tell you the truth, is to come and talk instead of signing or whatever. This is my favorite thing. And uh, I don't think of it as a show. And I'll prove it in the next hour. Uh, I think of it as a conversation with 4,000 of my closest friends. I'm going to treat you, I'll treat you just like if you were in my living room back at Malibu, except I won't be serving snacks. Um, and there's a lot to talk about. You know what's really interesting? Here you all are, and look at you, all excited. We're all dressed up, you know, we're out, out of the house. But people work all their lives to buy houses. They make down payments, they go to work, they get a house. As soon as they get the house, they go, I gotta get out of the house. I can't be in the house anymore. Just let's go somewhere. Let's get dressed up and go to a uh, celebration. Yeah. And there, yeah, and you all know, what's frightening to me is you all know more about the movies than I do. <laughs> Isn't that kind of ironic? Uh, and you come here, of course, and I see all your expectant faces looking up, saying, Mark, give us, a, give us a detail about episode eight. Just, just, just one little, you know, not a spoiler. Or talk about a new character or a new sequence or just you know, tell us something about eight. I, mean, I know you'll love the irony of the fact that I'm contractually forbidden to do that. It's funny, isn't it? It's funny because you spent all this money and I can't talk about Star Wars. <laughs> oh, you're not laughing. But I can talk about one through seven. I know those. And I'm ready, listen, I'm ready for questions anytime you are. I, you know, I said I'm going to prepare to, oh, if, if you brought Star Wars snacks, feel free to indulge. These graham crackers are really good. No, they're, let's see, I got, a, I got a Chewbacca. I don't think there's any, there's no Luke shapes, right? I don't think so. There's no, no Luke merchandising, is there? My earpiece is falling out, old sound man. But I'll answer questions, sure, right away. Well, you know what I should do really quickly? Quick background. I'm the middle of seven children. My oldest brother is William Thomas, Jr. Everybody called him Skip, because my dad was Bill. Then there was Terry, Suzanne. There was Jan Leslie. There was Mark Richard. There was Jeannie Diane. There was Kim Michelle and Patch, our youngest. Patrick Stephen. Um, let's see, there's one sister I'm forgetting. Oh, yeah, Carrie Fisher. Are there any Carrie fans out there? We love our Carrie Fisher, even when she's exasperating as all get out. I, 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 I emailed her when we were, you know, about a month ago. I said, Carrie, you know, it'd be really fun. We, I called Madame Tussauds, or Chelsea, when somebody called him on my behalf and said, can we come to the, to the Wax Museum, you know, and get in there, maybe right when it closes, we'll run in and take pictures. I said, Carrie, if we go and pose with each other's wax figures, come on, we'll break the internet. It'll be bigger than when I took a piggyback ride with Daisy Ridley. And uh, I didn't hear back from her, you know, I didn't hear back, didn't hear back, and I, was, I sort of forgot about it. Then one day I go on the internet, there she is, at the Wax Museum, all by herself. She took my idea and, and didn't invite me. <laughs> oh, that Carrie, but we love her. So yeah, let's, let's do questions, come on. What do you want to know? No math questions, please. Although the square root of 64 is eight. Thus concludes the, oh, you know what, too? You know, you talk about Carrie, everyone says, well, why don't you talk about Harrison? I'm glad to. He was the youngest Beatle. Uh, he was born in 1943. He was considered the quiet Beatle. I think he's a very, very witty guy, almost as 
probably George, you know, Paul, uh, John gets all the credit for being the wittiest. Oh, not, you're not, that's the wrong Harrison. You want to know about our ninth president, William Henry Harrison. We'll talk about him later in the educational portion of the show, which will come later. Take notes, there will be a pop quiz. Yeah. Mark, first of all, thank you very much for being here at Star Wars Celebration. We're all really excited. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much. I got one question for you. I had a scheduled trip to land on Skellig Michael with a boat ride mm. last week, but mm. it was canceled due to weather. Yeah. Wondering if you had a couple of canceled trips to Skellig Michael before you shot your scene. We got really lucky with the weather, and you never know. You know, this is a country where you get all four seasons in one day. It's sunny in the morning, then it rains, and we had sleet one day in out at Pinewood. We, are you kidding me? Sleet? Yeah. Uh, but. Uh, we got very lucky with the weather because basically you have to sit around and hope that the lights come through and it's okay. Did you go to the top? No, I didn't get it, but we did get a boat ride around it's it. It's brutal. <laughs> you just keep climbing and climbing and climbing and climbing. They cut out all the bits of Daisy because it took her about four hours to get to me, by the way. <laughs> they said, we'll just cut out this part to so get her up the mountain faster because people will be bored to be running out to get popcorn. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question. Give that man a, a picture. Did you get a signed picture? I'm giving away pictures to people that ask me questions. But in an orderly fashion, don't shout them out. I want to see hands. You will not degenerate into chaos. <laughs> not with me at the helm. Yes. Morning, Mark. Um, obviously, quite a few people at this convention, myself included, have photo shoots booked with you. Yeah. If you could go to your dream convention and have a photo shoot with anyone in the entertainment industry at the moment, who would it be? Oh, well, see, I was going to say the Marx Brothers, but you say at the moment. At the moment, alive at the moment. Gee, I don't know. There's so many people, you know? I went to the Captain America premiere. I'm just like you guys. Like, oh, look, there's Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I just, I, you know, I don't know. I love meeting people, you know? I got to meet all the cast. They said, because I wouldn't say, can I come to this set? But they said, do you want to visit the Rogue One set? I said, for sure, are you kidding me? So I met Felicity Jones. And Ben Mendelsohn I'd worked with before in this Star Citizen that Chris Roberts and I are doing. But to answer your question, the answer is, I don't know. Now <laughs> okay. give this man a picture. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Sorry. I want to meet you. That was good enough. Yeah. Howdy, Brian and Jake Angel, father and son team. Okay, all right. And, and uh, I understand that you have been a collector for many, many years. Yeah. And so my question is, what is, besides the Luke action figures, in the vintage line, <laughs> what is your favorite action figure, and particularly maybe the card back? Well, you know, I remember back when we were doing the movie, I was reading this thing, I said, it reads like a toy box. There's floating cars and there's, you know, fire swords and robots, and I mean, it's chock a block with toys. So I said to George, can I get on a list where I get one of everything? And he said, sure, because I thought, well, there'll be a poster. There'll be, I heard there was going to be a comic book and there'll be a t-shirt maybe and a record album. Well. The toys, it's like the uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice, bum, 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 bum. The toys just start coming to your house. And then, 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 every day, oh, there's oh, more toys. I'm only exaggerating a little bit. Nathan, when he was a baby, he could just, that's what he could recognize. You go, Kenner. You know, he's toddling over to the, that's what he could recognize, the word Kenner. But I gave all those toys to the kids. They grew up later and said, oh my God, Princess Lay in the Box is $1,400 in mint condition. Why'd you let us give her a Sinead O'Connor haircut? <laughs> with the cuticle scissors. I said, it was your toy. They should be played with and enjoyed by everybody. But I guess in terms of my toy collecting, you always like to collect what you liked as a kid. And I have so much. I mean, this new show I'm doing, Pop Culture Quest, is like an extension of my collecting because I can't, there's no more room in my house for stuff. That's what George Carlin talked about. We all need a place for our stuff. When I started putting my collection in storage bins in Port Wyoming, that's no fun. It's yeah. terrible. I, Your accountant I, calls it, did you get that Adventure 40 into the safety deposit box? That's not fun. <laughs> we want these things. We want these things to share and, and, and look at. So Pop Culture Quest, 
I'm doing as a, as a way for me to uh, have an excuse to come to your house and look at your collection. May your collection be with me. You, you may wind up at my house because I love the R5-D4 and you're on the card back. Wow, excellent. All right, give that man a picture. Let's have another question. Thank yes. You. Yes, yes, yes. Hey, Mark, just curious. Are there yeah. really 4,000 people here? Oh, my gosh. Now we're all best friends. Let's take a selfie. <laughs> Bang. Yeah. Do, do you enjoy the secrecy behind Star Wars or does it kill you like it kills me? <laughs> well, it can be really annoying and intrusive. You get call sheets, there's no names, everybody's got a number. You know, you're number 11, you're, you're 33. You're looking at the call sheets, wondering who's working today. You go, oh, I love 22's work. <laughs> She's twice as good as 11. <laughs> oh, all right. Everyone says on Twitter, oh, you're so dad humor. <laughs> I am. I don't know. I said, what is dad humor? I asked my kids, what's dad humor? And Chelsea goes, well, you know, obvious. Griffin said, puns. Nathan said, not funny. <laughs> so it makes me laugh. I love Twitter. It's fun. It's like going, it's more than electronic fan mail. It's like you get to interact with them and answer questions and so forth. But it, it, your question of secrecy, they're not doing it to annoy you. It's just that they want the surprise to be in the movie theaters, not on the internet. My two old parents. That's what it is. You don't want to know what you're getting for your birthday. I had two sisters that used to go up and look at my parents' closet and come down and say, you're getting a Beanie and Cecil board game for your birthday. Why'd you tell me? Now I have to act surprised, then you ruin the surprise. So no, I, 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 you know, I understand why they're doing it, but it can get really out of control, like I say, with the pages that get shredded every day. I have to, you know, I'm in the elderly recluse phase of my career. I have to write cartoons in the margins to make me remember these lines. You can't do that on a pad. I need old school, I need a script that you can write on, that you can take home and look and read. So they'd let me have one scene and i keep it on my person, you know, uh, because you get really paranoid. You think, ooh, I left the pad. I wonder if the maid knows the code. It's this long. It's crazy with numbers and letters and capitals and small and really bad. There's a short, there was a short uh, uh, way to do it, but if you had your pad off for longer than three days, then it would go back to the long one. It drives me crazy. It really does. But it's for your viewing pleasure that we do this. Okay, so who else? Got a question? I gotta go fast because there's so many people. And look, oh my gosh, it's already 44 minutes. Here, I'll talk fast, yes. Mark, yes. what was your first reaction when you found out what your part on episode seven would actually be? Did you think it was funny? Were you insulted? No, no, I wasn't insulted. I thought it was a really uh, a great surprise. But I don't think they prepared me correctly. You know, in other words, you know, I went to training and, you know, I lost all this weight and did all these things. And I thought, I must be doing something physical if they're sending me to the gym twice a week uh, and torturing me physically. But uh, I think they could have prepared me a little better. It reminds me of the story of the guy that goes on vacation. He has his friend watch his house, see? And the guy goes away and he comes back and asks his friend, it's all about preparing you, right, for, for the fact that, well, it's going to happen. The guy goes on vacation, he comes back and he says to his friend, so how did it go? And his friend says, well, your cat's dead. And the guy said, what? My cat's dead? Oh, my God, that's terrible. And why did you tell me like that? He said, well, the friend says, well, how did you want me to tell you? He said, well, you could have prepared me a little bit. You know, you could have said that your cat was playing on the roof and you could say he, he saw a bird and he scampered across the roof and he took a misstep and he fell to the ground and unfortunately he didn't make it. Something like that. My friend says, okay. And the guy says, any other news? And his friend says, well, your mother was playing on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> now, I tell that because it's funny because... 
It's about cats dying. <laughs> but beyond that, it's about preparing you, about saying, oh, by the way, you know all that workout where you lost all the weight? You're going to have to turn and remove your hood. I said, like, oh, I got to lie down for a minute. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, no, that's good. Now you can tell your friends, he was really weird. He got on stage and he took a nap. I think it was performance art. I don't know what the hell was going on. All right, another question, please. Uh, I'd like to just once uh, say again, thanks for being here. You yeah. just made me the happiest little fanboy 12-year-old probably in this whole convention. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, you guys. So my question, I was like, uh, I thought, well, what was Mark Hamill's funniest moment of filming between one and three, being New Hope and... and you, uh, you know what's interesting is, like, you forget about these things, and then you see on the in internet clips, or I guess they put things on for DVD extras, and even in a scene as serious as Ben Kenobi being cut down, we were laughing so much. All the time we were laughing. I mean, we had to be serious and be sincere, but come on, it was just goofier than hell. I mean, the, the, you know, you're sitting next to Sir Alec Guinness, one of the most venerated actors in the English-speaking world, and a guy in an eight-foot dog costume with headphones on. I mean, what's wrong with this picture? It's just really odd. People would ask me, I met my wife, she was my dental hygienist, and, you know, we went out and she says, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm I'm in this movie, and what's it called? It's called Star Wars. And she goes, is that like Star Trek? And I went, <laughs> yes, it's exactly like Star Trek. <laughs> it would be easier just to say that and then see what she says when she saw it, which is, I told this story before, but it makes me laugh so hard. Because you know how everybody watches things it's called from their own limited perspective? So she's a dental hygienist, so she's watching the movie. And you have to imagine back before you were born, that ship coming over at the very beginning goes on and on and on and on. The audience just went, whoa, then. Now you need more for your thrills. But then it was like, oh my gosh, that's so impressive. And they, so they were really sort of bedazzled by that. And then they cut to what I call the bad guys board room meeting. Gentlemen, this pointless bickering, all that. But Richard Lamont Parmentier is delivering that line, you know, that Lord Vader, your sorcerer's ways have not, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> the location of the hidden rebel base. And my wife, she doesn't take her eyes off the screen. She was my girlfriend then, she goes, bad caps. <laughs> <laughs> really? That's what you're, you're reviewing it from a dental point of view. <laughs> May the floss be with you. All right, give that guy a picture, another question. Mark, Mark. Yes, yes, yes. I'm way in the back here. You are? Yeah. All right. Uh, every once in a while, I'll pop in with a question way in the back. Okay. I, um, I have one way back here. Good. Hello. Hi. <laughs> I was wondering what your favorite part has been so far of just making the franchise. Well, you know, that's it. It's so hard to pick just one. People say, what's your favorite Beatles song? I mean, it, it's, it's hard to pick one, but I love swinging across with the princess. That was so much fun. And they got it in one take. You know, usually you have to do four, five, six, ten takes. Go back to your trailer and have lunch, and we're going to come back and do it again. They got it in one take. Four cameras running. I was so disappointed because we were in harnesses. The same guys that flew Peter Pan, Foils of London. So they said, you want to fly? I said, so much, because, you know, one take. They said, well, unhook him from Carrie, and they flew me all around the set. I mean, it was Peter Pan time. And George was like, ah, get him down. It's an insurance risk. If, if he hits a wall like Wile E. Coyote, the whole movie's off. There'll be a stain on the wall. But that I loved. I loved the cantina sequence, because in the movie like this, you were always wondering, where's the creature going to be? And I guess to a certain extent, there were sand people, and there was uh, Jawas and so forth, but, and there was Darth Vader. Come to think of it, there were a lot of creatures. But my point is, when you walked into that bar, everywhere you looked, I thought that was so novel, uh, an idea to go into a bar where everybody's a creature different from you, except for you. 
very, there was got lots of good stuff I loved, yeah. Hi Mark, um, I was wondering if you could tell us what your favorite part of the filming process is. Of, of the, the what now? Filming process. So is it um, seeing the final product or learning your lines or? Oh, you know, I always remember the people. I remember the people more than the specific line. I remember, oh, Colin Skeeping, my stunt guy, or whoever, my dressers. Everybody's so nice. I mean, telling you, I really love what I do. I'm so lucky to be able to do what I want to do. When I was a kid, you know, I had a little tape recorder. I would tape, you know, I love the sound of people's accents. Bela Lugosi, I never drink wine. You know, I thought, well, where's this guy from? Why does he talk like that? Uh, hearing the Beatles dialects, I, I love the sound of it all. And so I would be practicing and my mom would say things like, well, yes, honey, that is a very good Elmer Fudd impression, but it's not going to help you later in life with your profession. <laughs> I haven't played, no, I haven't played, uh, I haven't played uh, Elmer Fudd, but I loved Peter Lorre, I loved that. Boris Karloff, I love the way he spoke. I don't know where he's from, and he's got a slight lisp. But I, I love the sound. Uh, Laurel and Hardy. I, I said, w where is this guy from? Before the internet, I know a lot of you can't remember this, but before the internet, you actually had to go to the library and look things up in books. Which is very embarrassing, because I'm not really an intellectual person. I don't want to know about Russian history and ancient Rome, I said, you know, do you have any books on the Three Stooges, you know? <laughs> but, you know, I like having fun. I'm like right now, I'm having so much fun, you guys. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, give her a picture and let's have another question. Hi there, Mark. Hi. 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 I follow your Twitter feed and find you extremely funny. You do, thank you. There, here's, here's the guy. <laughs> He's the one. At school, were you the cocky, kind of confident type that, like my daughter? Did? Yeah, well, see, now I tell you, <laughs> I went to nine schools in 12 years, okay? Because we moved all the time because my dad was in the Navy. And I, that's how I wound up going to Yokohama High School in Japan. And I, I used humor as a weapon, you know, because if you could make a bully laugh, they, they forget why they wanted to punch you in the face. Uh, and I wasn't really an athlete, the things I was good at athletically, like swimming, or I did join the wrestling team for a year, but um, I didn't play football or, you know, I, I, yeah, I, I like making people laugh, but I wasn't really, I'd always sit in the back of the uh, classroom just to sort of suss out and figure out where I belonged, who should I hang with and all that. And then you just get to the part where you feel like you're sort of comfortable and you go, ah, oh, dad got transferred, we're going to, wherever, Pennsylvania, or Virginia, or, or San Diego. Uh, so, no, I wasn't the class clown. I, I was like the, I was the sidekick. I loved class clowns. I loved to laugh. I'm a good audience, and uh, I would hang out with the class clowns. Thank you, and I look forward to Killing Joke as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know about that? I'm telling you. Be careful what you wish for, because I kept saying, you know, when, when Joker was over for me, I said, you know what we ought to do, is we ought to do Killing Joke, and um, the thing is, it's not for kids, and I, I really apologize, it's, it's rated R. Oh, thanks, Chelsea. <laughs> um, but uh, it's really mean and nasty, and by the way, for you, Alan Moore fundamentalists, of which I am one, it's not, because I thought of it as a book on tape where we can do every single word, right, and just do music and sound effects, because Alan Moore doesn't like anything that they do, you know, V for Vendetta, he didn't like that, he didn't like Watchmen, it's just, you know, he's a perfectionist, so he's going to hate Killing Joke, but it, it's, Killing Joke is embedded in a larger story that I can tell you involves Batgirl and Batman. And I, like I say, it's, um, it, it's earned its R rating. I mean, they, they really did it like the book. And uh, I can only tell, kids, kids will come up to me and say, oh, I'm so excited for The Killing Joke. I say, don't, don't you watch that? Because <laughs> uh, it, it got progressively weirder and harsher as we got into the 
the video games. Or I'll talk over in this direction for a while. Uh, no. We'll pit side against side. It will be like the sharks and the jets. Um, but no, I do, I, there's, a, it's a, there's a, a version of uh, Joker that's going to be on. Um, it's called JLA. What does it stand for? Justice League Action. That's what it's called. And they're 11 minute cartoons. <laughs> Look at you. And I like the short form cartoons. I like regular show. I like regular show. Uh, because they're short. You know, you, they, you get on, you establish the premise, you're entertaining, and get off! Leave the people wanting more! Don't hang around until you, everyone's sick of you. And speaking of which... Oh, okay. Is it counting down? Oh, I see what it was. A minute ago, I thought we were at the 44-minute mark. I said, how can that be? No, we had 44 minutes left. Oh, my God, it's going down. We still have half an hour! Woo! Half an hour to be probed ruthlessly by all of you kids out there. So anyway, Justice League action is, is it's back to old school. It is for young people. You know, really, let's face it. That's my crowd. The young and the mentally young. <laughs> Woo! I know. I know. You can see. Because you can relax around me, see? It's not like around, you get around some other star and you go, oh, I don't know what to do or how to sit here. Come on. Um, I'm easy peasy. That's the thing. I always like having a good time if I can manage it. Dentist's office, that's a real challenge. But look, I, got, I found my wife at the dentist's office, so there's good things associated with it as well. Next question, yes. Um. Hello, Mark. Yes. Um, me and my friends, we have come from Poland to all the way to see you. Born Germany? <laughs> no, but I'm working there right now. Oh, so okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Very complicated. So, um, first of all, guys, I wanted to say to all the audience here, this is incredible because not only me, but I know all of the guys here and girls were waiting like 40 hours, 20 hours to, to see you. And that's true. I've been so waiting with my friends. I've been waiting with my friends for like uh, 9 p.m. from oh. from for yesterday, all the night, four different queues to just to see you, and it's and it's extraordinary. It's oh, something. Great. Thank you so, so much. So guys, I know you've been, you've done this all. Yeah. It's yeah. great. It's great. Um, so uh, my question is, uh, maybe it's make make you a bit uh, comfortable, <laughs> but. Um, all of these years, you've been like a Star Wars superstar. Um, but there are, there are other film options for you. Yeah. Have you ever, ever a uh, problem with that? Or you've been angry because all the producers, all the filmmakers have seen nothing but Luke Skywalker in you. And yeah. was this every, um, ever any problem here? you? Have you have you felt a bit angry because all the people no, see you and it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. you're... It's well, no, but see, the thing is, I got to go... I think you get to play the most character roles on the stage and in animation where they can't see you. So I got all my sort of character actor licks out on Broadway playing Mozart or, or in, in Harrigan and Hart. I mean, you know, I, I live in a, a semi-delusional bubble, I'm sure, you know, where it's like... Uh, it's, it's, I'm isolated and, and I'm really happy doing whatever I'm doing. I really enjoy doing Miles from Tomorrowland and um, all the cartoons, I love it. The people are so nice, the casts are spectacularly talented. Let me tell you, you get in a room with eight voiceover artists, it's like a thousand people. They all can imitate other people. So, you know, you have all the, you know, Clark Gable interviewing Jerry Lewis. Why? It's just amazing. So there you are. And I know there was a question embedded in there somewhere, but I ignored it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Look at how happy everyone is to be out of the house. I tell you, that's my theory. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, by the way, I was on a shoot yesterday where it's a video game, and everybody's wearing those motion capture suits. And they all have a piece of tape with their name on it. Eleanor, Anthony, Ian. I thought, what a great idea. 
I should run for president on a platform of labeling people in everyday life because you feel like you know them. Hey, how's it going, Ian? Nice to see you, you know, because I have a terrible, as I get older, I can't remember people's names. That's why I heard, uh, uh, you know, Humphrey Barr called everybody pal. Hey, pal. Nice to see you, pal. That's more Charles Bronson. But you get the point. I should pick a word. One for guys, one for girls. No, sweethearts too, honey. No, I'll figure it out. But it'll be a generic word that I call everybody. Because you walk by, can you imagine if uh, Bogart walked by and said, hey, how you doing, pal? Oh my God, Humphrey Bogart just said hi to me. He called me pal too. Yes, look at you all dressed up. You look more like me than me. Thank you. Um... Yeah, so obviously you've been uh, everyone's childhood hero and adulthood hero. Um, and you've actually been my uh, favorite villain since I was a little kid, being the Joker, yeah. obviously. Um, I was just wondering if you had a favorite monologue or quote from that series, the Batman anim animated series, as the Joker. I've got millions, but I want to know your favorite one. Wow. You know what was great about the animated series was each episode was slightly different. There was Christmas with the Joker, which sort of... Which was amazing. And parodied Christmas specials. Yeah. I thought that was hilarious. There were other episodes where he was a little darker. The Laughing Fish was based on an actual comic book. It was this a great story. Then there were others where you go, Joker's being used as a device, really, because like in Harley and Ivy, they team up as sort of a Thelma and Louise parody, and they leave Joker behind. He's clueless without Harley. He's like shuffling around the house in his slippers. You know, he loses all desire to <laughs> commit crime. So he was really sort of like this cuckolded husband and it was funny. I mean, each time I play it, you know, I figure this is the first time. This will be the first time I've ever played the Joker, you know, and, and approach it just in a finite way where, you know, you pick your favorite episode, I would have looked at it and said, this is the only time you've ever seen the Joker. Forget about Christmas with the Joker, forget about Laughing Fish, you know, just focus on this one. And like I say, I liked Almost Got Him. I think one of my favorites is um, Paul Dini wrote, the man who killed Batman. The speech when he's in the coffin. I know, that oh, eulogy. Iconic. Are you Absolutely kidding iconic. me? I could do that eight times a week. I mean, where you really relish the dialogue. I was looping episode eight yesterday, and there's dialogue in there. I thought, oh boy, I can already see this on a t-shirt. <laughs> Seriously. Ryan Johnson is amazing. He'll make you forget all about May the Force Be With You. He's come up with so many new catchphrases. Could you give us a little teaser of that dialogue? Uh, well, here's a quote, by the way. You mean Joker? Yes, yes, the Joker. Sorry, I didn't mean I'm not warmed up, believe me. You've got to warm up to do the Joker. It's like drive, <clears throat> driving your car in, uh, in the winter. You'll just strip it and it'll be horrible. So when I drive to uh, uh, the valley where I do it, you know, I live in the, at the beach, and so it'll take me about an hour to get there. And I warm up, you know, I put on the kinks or whoever, and I sing and, and you warm up your voice. Uh, I'm not warmed up, but here, here's, a, here's a quote from, um, from Killing Joke. Memory so treacherous. One moment you're lost in a carnival of delights with the poignant childhood aromas, the flashing neon puberty, all that sentimental candy floss. The next, it leads you somewhere you don't want to go. Somewhere dark and cold and filled with the damp, ambiguous shapes of things you'd hope were forgotten. The memories can be vile, repulsive little Bruce. Like children, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we're having fun now. <laughs> oh, we're having so much fun. We're having so much fun. We'll have another question. Mark, Mark, I'm yeah. way up here on your far left. Yes. Way up top, yeah. far left. Yes, yes. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Hi. Um, so we've got Star Wars. You know, we grew up with that when we were, you know, children growing up now, even adults. What did you have when you were a child uh, to, you know, 
Uh, uh, films were your favorite? The first show the I remember watching and loving was The Adventures of Superman, the black and white one with George Reeves. And they made the later seasons in color. Before anybody had color TVs, they were visionary. They thought, we're going to put some episodes together and release them as a feature film overseas. So people didn't see them in color till 10 years after they were made. Loved Superman. I didn't even know he was in a comic book. I thought it was just a TV show. So that was sort of my gateway entry into fandom, is the, is the George Reeves Superman. I like Zorro. I like comedy. I love the Marx Brothers and Laurel and Hardy, the Honeymooners. I love Little Rascals. I brought Little Rascals over to London with me to watch, because, you know, when I do the treadmill or something that I don't want to do, you go, okay, this is either two and a half Bugs Bunny cartoons <laughs> or, you know, an episode of The Honeymooners. And that's the way I do it. So all those things. Yes. yes. Oh, I'm Robert from Orange County, California. I'm Mark Hamill. I was born in Oklahoma. Uh, uh, Oakland. Uh, <laughs> but proceed, I love, counselor. Yeah. I love Toy Story 3 and I'm a big fan of Michael Arndt. Were there any story ideas from him that you liked that didn't make it into the final film? Episode 7. Uh, and what, what property are you talking about specifically? Toy Story 3, Michael Arndt. Oh, Toy Story, Story 3. Well, yeah, see, Arndt. now, I didn't get to read Michael's script. I'd love to. Oh. But I did go up to Northern California, and the artists were saying, oh, I've been drawing you for a year. And you saw all this conceptual art where Art Luke's, you know, in scuba gear with, uh, you know, with uh, Daisy's character. What's her name? Ray. Ray. Uh, I, listen, wait, you guys, I haven't seen it in a long time. Myself. Wait, what, what's her last name? <laughs> oh, it's a trick question. Ah, I don't know. I don't know. Thank you. It's a trap. Working with you. <laughs> Very clever. Because that'll happen to me. You know, I'll get bewildered and blurt out inadvertent spoilers. <laughs> Oops, did I say that? Yeah. <laughs> What's your last name? Why, you? No. <laughs> yeah, another question? Uh, hey, Mark. Yeah. Um, I don't know how many people here have seen it, but you made a movie called Comic Book the Movie, which yeah. is like you and your voice actor friends just yeah. having a laugh. I love it. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us about making that and what inspired you Well, basically, you no, part? I was pitching Black Pearl, a movie I've been trying to get made for years. Uh, and uh, um, I went in to pitch it at this place, and they said, well, we really don't have the budget for that kind of thing. What we want to do is a sequel to, I think they call it Star Trek Memories. It was just William Shatner and uh, Leonard Nimoy sitting in a garden talking about Star Trek. So I thought, well, I want to do something. I want that. I think they had $200,000. I said, I should make something, but I don't know if I should just rehash Star Wars questions, much like I'm doing now. <laughs> but no, uh, I, so it occurred to me, I said, what could we do with the documentary that is spectacular to see? You see, like, you know, you know where you, uh, you don't have to have a big budget to show really interesting things. Like the, at the time, Morgan Spurlock hadn't done his. I said, we should go to the San Diego Comic Con. We didn't have much prep. We, it happened in like three weeks. That's why I called all my voiceover friends, Jess Arnell and Roger Rose and Billy West and all these, uh, Lori Allen, all, everybody in it. I mean, I'm telling you, it was spectacular, filled with some of the best voiceover people in the world. world you know, you read the cast list and I'm the only one you've never heard of. But uh, they said if, the, if, if some terrible accident happened, at a screening or at the, uh, when you guys were doing it, the entire cartoon industry would be wiped out because everybody's in it, Powerpuff Girls, Simpsons. And that is sort of my love letter to obsessive compulsives, collectors. Uh, you know, because uh, at the San Diego Con, they said, well, we're not sure that we really want you up here because you're, if, if you're going to be snarky, like uh, they said, Trekkies. I said, what's Trekkies? They said, well, it's you know, a movie where they, they show the most extreme examples of fandom, and they try and make fun of them or something. I said, that's not me, you know? I mean, I think Howard Stern's funny, but it's a mean kind of humor that doesn't come naturally to me. I like everybody to laugh. I don't want everyone to laugh at you, at your expense, you know? I don't want to do a show at you. I wanted to do a show with you. So 
I, you know, I had to go up and reassure them. They were ready to rescind. Uh, they didn't let me film. I'm still mad about this. I built, only money I spent on that was to build the Commander Courage outfit. I didn't have anything in the budget. So it was nominally, there was a storyline I came up with, but everybody else was, they were improvising. And I would tell them what the story is. And I said, when we film, just act like your character. But part of it was that, that this, this guy was gonna get into the costume competition with his Commander Courage outfit. At the last minute, they said, no, you can't come to the co costume competition. I thought, darn it, that's the most colorful. Has anybody been to the costume competition in San Diego? Oh, my God. And the costumes, my goodness. You know, I mean, some of them we couldn't even put on film. We'd get an R rating. <laughs> Seriously. There are women out there that shave to get into those costumes. <laughs> Now, uh, but I like it. It's, it's, it's an affectionate thing. It's not, it's not kind of mean bone in its body. And by the way, if you look at the second disc, the uh, list of uh, uh, the, the extras on it are spectacular. Lots of people say, how do I get into voiceover? I want to do cartoons. And get, look at the second disc. I'm not trying to sell this, you know, rent it or something. I'd be, probably download it for free. I'm not making any money on it, but... Uh, the second disc has this panel of people telling you how they got their start in voiceover. Jim Cummings, this guy's a titan. You know, Maurice LaMarche, people that are way more prolific than I am, you know. The people have just heard of me because, uh, you know, I've been in other things. But some of these people, you just go, oh my gosh, this is, this is a deeply gifted man. James Arnold Taylor, what does he do, like 50, 50 voices in a... 50 voices in 30 seconds? It's amazing. All right, next question, please. Thank we keep you. giving out pictures so we run out. Well, Hi, Mark. Yes. Uh, I'd like to know who your favorite Star Wars character is apart from Luke Skywalker. Well, Luke's not my favorite character. I remember reading the original script and thinking, who's this Han Solo guy? He's got the snappy dialogue. He's a tough guy. He's spurring with the princess. And, you know, this guy's going, go and leave. They followed us, you know. Uh, but I, you know, again, people say, well, who's your favorite kid? I mean, you love them all for different reasons. I, I don't have a favorite character. I have lots of characters I like, for sure. Um, and you've all heard that story how I got the part, because when I got the part, I hadn't read the script. I read one scene. We're in the cockpit, right? Hey, kid, I've you know, fulfilled my part of the bargain. <laughs> After you pay me off, I'm... Uh, I'm out of here. <laughs> and I said, but we, we can't turn back. Fear is their greatest defense. I doubt if the actual security there is any greater than it was on Aquila or Celest. And what there is is most likely directed towards a large-scale assault. <laughs> I had to say that. I had to diagram it like a... I said, does this, does this, who talks like this? Fear is their greatest defense. We're, you know, that's no moon, that's, that's no moon, that's a space station. <laughs> so uh, I said, wait a second. Fear is their greatest defense. Well, okay, I get that. You know, we're intimidated by the Death Star. I doubt that the actual security there is any greater than it was on Aquila or Sullust. Okay, those are just two made up names of asteroids or planets that George came up with. I get that. And what there is, is most likely directed towards a large-scale assault. Oh, because they wouldn't expect the Millennium Falcon to slip in. It's like the size, it's smaller than an M&M compared to the Death Star. Uh, so it makes sense, but you try and say that sentence. That'll be your assignment, everyone. <laughs> Memorize this line, practice it, and the next time we're at Celebration, I will have someone get up and say this. It's not in the movie, it's only in the screen test. But we can't turn back. Fear is their greatest defense. I doubt if the actual security there is any greater than it was on Aquila or Sullust. And what there is is most likely directed towards a large-scale assault. See, it's easy. <laughs> yeah. Remember, Harrison said, you can type this, you just can't say it. We used to try and, you know, force George, at, you know, to say his own dialogue. 
Really? That's okay. He says, oh, I get the part, right? They call me up and they say, oh, you got the part. And I said, oh, great. I get to go to England. I get to meet Sir Alec Guinness. It's my first movie. I'm very excited. And they said, and, and they said we'll send the script over. I hadn't read the script. I couldn't even remember who I auditioned for. It had been a month and a half or something. Uh, and so I open up the script and it says, The Adventures of Luke Skywalker, as taken from the Journal of the Wills. Saga number one, The Star Wars. I said, wait a minute, was I Luke? No, no. I was, because, you know, Harrison to me was a leading man guy. You know, he was, I don't know how old he was, 35 or something. So I said, oh, I'm his sidekick. Plus, he was cool. I was the one, you know, being, no, no, take me here, you know. Um, stamping my feet, I want to go to Aquiline. And he's, hey, you know, whatever. So I thought he was the lead. Who wouldn't? That's a leading man. It's got to be about him. So I start reading this thing, and oh my gosh. I'm telling you, it, it, was, it was magical. You didn't have to have the special effects and the music and everything. The, the magic was in those words and that imagery. It was just fantastic. And I, you know, I kept going back and saying, I can't be this Luke guy. It's his story. Or at least it's from his point of view. I thought I was going to play the sidekick to the lead guy. So I said, I, I can't remember. I called my agent. I said, who, who did I audition for again? Am I this? Who am I? They said, you're Luke. I said, oh my gosh, I couldn't believe it. I get a floating car, oh wow. <laughs> I get my own robot, I get two robots. I get this light up, I don't know, the sword, fire sword or something. It's, it's wild, man, it's funnier than hell. It's really funny, I mean, that's another thing is when I did the screen test, I said, is this like, is this parody? Is it like a Mel Brooks movie or something? I mean, who talks like this? And I was trying to, you know, ask George, is this, are we, is this sort of like a parody of, uh, of Flash Gordon? And he's like, you know, he's like, oh, well, oh, it's just like, uh, well, let's just do it and we'll talk about it later. <laughs> and of course, you learn that you, don't talk about it, and then you never talk about it later. It's a technique of his. You know, because if you go up and ask a director a question, they'll go, hmm, that's interesting. Well, let me think about it, and I'll get back to you. Don't trust him. They'll never come back to you. But, uh, uh, and then I went to Harrison, because he'd been in American Graffiti. I loved American Graffiti. I went out for American Graffiti. I didn't get it. You know, it was Fred Roos. I didn't even meet George. You get to a state, you know, they're doing eliminations before you meet the top guys. So I went out for, I don't know what part, it must have been Ron Howard's part, you know, I don't, I love that movie, maybe Charlie Martin Smith's part, I don't know. But I didn't get past that first cut, you know, where you go in then and read. They remembered me probably and said he might be right for uh, Luke Starkiller. And by the way, in the, when I told you the story about the title page, it was the adventures of Luke Starkiller as taken from the Journal of the Wills. And I, in fact, I remember when they said, we got, I said, why are we shooting me rescuing the princess again? We already did that last week. Uh, and they said, well, they're, they're changing your name. Because I remember I take off my helmet. She goes, aren't you a little short for a stormtrooper? I said, I'm Luke Starkiller, I'm here to rescue you. I love that line too. It's like, didn't you get the memo? I mean, <laughs> you're a princess, that's what we do. We rescue you, look at you right there on the aisle. Stand up, look at, there's a perfect Princess Leia. Oh, look at how lovely you are. Make a turn, there you go. Yeah. And they said, no, we're changing your name. And they, they could have just gone to the back of my head and I could have dubbed it later, but you know, the most expensive low budget movie, we actually went back and reshot a scene. And I said, okay, so what is my name? Because you know what it's like, you get used to a name. I'm Luke Starkiller, that's what I know. And they said, oh, we're going to be Luke Skywalker. I said, Luke Skywalker? It sounds like Luke Flyswatter. I hate that name. I hate that name. I want to be Luke Starkiller. I could use the macho. You know, uh, it's got a little grit to it, but people didn't like the name 
with kill in it. So, you know what I mean. It's one of those things. That's why we're all here. Not only do we want to go out, we, I don't want to deal with reality. I hate the news. Everything's terrible. Well, I don't want that. I want to be in a galaxy far, far away. I need to, don't we all? <laughs> yeah. We, we don't want politics and we don't want climate change and we don't want our mom telling us to pick our dirty underwear off the floor. We don't want that. We just want to have fun. And we're having fun right now. Oh, good, I got to go fast. Yes, yes, yes. And I want to get to the kids too, so, yes. Good day, Mark. Yeah, good day. Uh, Robbie Martin, Australia. Yeah. Um, although I live here, so I guess I'm cheating. Um, so for episode seven, I was just wondering for your journey, for the arc of your character, how much did you know beyond episode seven? That's very interesting, because you say, look, what does Luke know? Can he feel that Han Solo's in danger? All those things, see? I said, even if you don't, if you don't plan to tell the audience, I have to know for myself. I made up a whole backstory of what happened between getting my medal, and yes, I agree, the Wookiee should have gotten one too. <laughs> <laughs> we really deserved one, but you know, we were less enlightened in those days. But, uh, but you're right, I said, because if you don't tell the audience, it's not about me anymore. It's really not my story. It's the story of Ray and Finn and Poe and all of them, which is the way it should be. But um, uh, you'll find out more. Uh, I don't think anyone will ever say, that's exactly what I wanted. And I better be careful, by the way, because I I, for seven, I said, in front of a crowd like you, I said, no matter what we do, there, you know, it's, it's going to be, uh, we can't please everyone. The headline out of that speech? Star Wars 7 bound to disappoint, says Mark Hamill. <laughs> no, that's the, that was the headline. And they called me. Did you say this? I said, well, I, you know, I know I'm not in those words, but I said, there's no way you can make everybody go, oh, that's perfect, that's exactly what I wanted. But I, I loved everything in 7. You know, I, you know, because when I sat down to read it, you should have seen me. What's the very first words in the crawl? Luke Skywalker has vanished. I said, oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading, reading. I'm making notes. Every time everyone says, you know, Skywalker must be stopped, page 34. <laughs> the sword of Skywalker is powerful, page 77. Uh, so I have this long list, and, you know, I'll tell you where I thought I came in. In the forest, when the, the lightsaber goes like this and flies off, I said, oh, what a great entrance, ah! <laughs> Ray caught it? She hasn't even been to Dagobah for training! <laughs> What's the deal? I know, everyone said... <laughs> You didn't finish your training either, so you have no room to talk. I was a, you know, a Jedi school dropout, but uh, <laughs> I had to get back to my friends. That was my excuse. I had to be with my friends. I say to you, oh, Minnie, you must have. No, I got to be with my friends. Please. All right, I hope I didn't answer your question. Thank you. I mean, I did. Hello. Um, if you could be young and unknown again, what role would you like to be for episode seven? Whose character would you like to play? Oh, gosh. I usually judge by what they get to do. You know, Poe gets to fly and, you know, uh, you know, I love it all. I'm an actual fan, you know. Basically, you know, it's interesting to me because now you have a fan generation interpreting these things, whether it's J.J. Abrams or now Ryan Johnson. You know, to see the, the and I think it's healthy for kids to see what we look like. I mean, you don't want to know. A six-year-old has no concept of time. The parents say, oh, look, guess who that is? It's Luke Skywalker. And they look at me, and they're aghast. What happened to this guy? <laughs> he really let himself go. Because they think we made the movie, like, what, three weeks ago? Because there's no way to date it. There's no cars or hairstyles or whatever. You know, a six-year-old, what, what's their concept of time? 
Uh, but I think it's healthy for everyone to see how, how we, everyone naturally progresses. Um, and uh, I usually like everybody but myself. Because I said to JJ and to Kathy, I said, look, if I turn around and people perceive it as like a big gimmick or something, they're going to groan. And by the way, I'm the one with egg on my face. You'll be sitting on a beach somewhere getting a tan. So I was really nervous. I was hoping, oh, I hope this works. I hope this works. Because if I turn around and take the hood down, everybody goes, ow. That's what I was nervous at. But I forgot the buildup and, and John Williams' music. And, you know, I thought it worked very well. In fact, I, I want to do movies now where I don't do anything. I don't talk. <laughs> I get second billing. And, you know, I'm in the movie less than 30 seconds. Less is more. A little of me goes a long way. You know, okay, I got a minute and 43 seconds. Yes, yes. Hi, Mark. Yeah, hi. Just a quick thank you. Um, myself and my wife are on honeymoon here. Aww. You are making this the best honeymoon wow. ever for us. Honeymoon. Oh, romantic. Oh, that's wonderful. Ever since I was a kid, been a fan of Star Wars like everybody else here. But I've always had a penchant for the dark side. Ooh. Have you never, ever been a bit regretful that Luke didn't turn? Well, the thing, you know, my son Nathan tells me, Dad, hey, you know, in the e well, you know, I told this already, and it's out there, so we can tell you, the original image in Episode 7 was a hand holding a lightsaber flying through space. <laughs> can you imagine that? Because that would have been, I would have been in the first shot and the last shot. <laughs> Perfect symmetry. But I said, what happened to that? You know, because it goes flying, 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 and the, the flesh burns away and the bones fall, and it goes, shoom, you know, into the, the surface of Jakku. See, I know a little bit about Star Wars. Uh, it's Jakku. Uh, but uh, for some reason, they decide not to do that. And so I'm reading, 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 reading. Where is Luke? Where is Luke? Everybody's talking about me. It's the most elaborate entrance in the history of show business. And then it's over. You show up, turn around, pull down your hood. You don't even know what's, what, you know, it, it's really literally a cliffhanger. That's what I love, the visual pun of him standing on a cliff. Did you get that? Subtle. And, uh, and someone said to me, is that a gravestone next to your, you remember that question? I don't know. It looked like a rock to me. But I love it. I love you people, you know, knowing so much and being so focused on every minute detail. Uh, and then, of course, the disappointment in your faces when you actually meet me and I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> All right, let's go to Lucas, this little Leia. Yes. Oh, I'm at zero. I got to get out of here. So you guys, wait a second. A final question. Did we give away all the pictures? Do you still <coughs> um, meet up with your Star Wars friends? Yeah, you know, it's, I'm telling you, I told you I love Carrie. She's like a sister to me. I don't see her for years, just like a real sister. <laughs> and then when you see them, you're so happy to see them again. We went into a restaurant and Harrison was there and Peter Mayhew and Tony Daniels and everything it was fantastic. It's like when you see old friends you haven't seen in a long time and, you know, instead of not having everything, anything to talk about, it's just like no time has passed at all. We really have a special bond, that, a shared experience. I think that's what it is. But aren't you adorable? Look at you all dressed up. That was our last question. I love the costumes. It's so fantastic. Yes. So I, in my mind, I see blinking zeros. I think security is going to wrestle me to the ground if I don't <laughs> shut up. But listen, you know, I, it, it sounds corny, but you know, you guys have been there from the very start and supported us through thick and thin, through highs and lows, and I can't tell you how much that means to me. I never expected to be in anything that, that would be remembered, or at least remembered fondly. 
Uh, and, you know, I, I think of you guys more as like my extended support group. You know, you're like, you are more like family than fans. And uh, we can't thank you enough. We hope you all enjoy. I'm, I tell you, I can't wait for Rogue One. That, that looks fantastic. Yeah. And you know what I think? One of the great things, one of the great things about these standalone films. Okay. Ooh. So I'm going to take that. For, <laughs> put it in my collection. Uh, the, the one thing that's great about these standalone films is you can have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and boom, it's gone. This one looks sort of like a war movie to me. It looks gritty and real. You know, I thought, they better make Han Solo, the young Han Solo movie like Butch Cassidy, you know? He's got to be one step ahead of the sheriff, gambling, you know, girlfriends getting mad at him. It could be a real rollicking comedy. There's such a broad range of what they're going to be able to do with these standalone films because they don't have to support that three-film structure. But listen, you guys, they, they're going to get a big hook and pull me off if I don't go. Thank you so much for coming. Oh! A special guest star!